The book makes the case for hemp as the world's savior. And Jack backs it up with a $50,000 offer to anyone who can prove him wrong. So far, he's had no takers. The book also takes us on a journey of the bizarre, the curious origin of marijuana prohibition. Only in the 20th century did the ancient hemp plant become a frightening new drug. The Mexican slang word, marijuana, was unknown to most Americans until it began appearing in newspaper headlines early in the century. Marijuana horror stories, works of pure fiction, were staples of the sensationalistic newspapers owned by William Randolph Hearst. But even respectable papers printed outrageous tales. Although this story would be relegated to the tabloids today, it was fit to print in the distinguished New York Times on July 6, 1927. A Mexican woman and her four children are driven insane by marijuana, the New York Times reported. It went on to say that neighbors rushed to the house to find the entire family insane. <laughs> incurably in Spain, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which it was addicted. It is recommended, Your Honor, that the defendant be placed at an institution for the criminally insane for the rest of his natural life. The next tragedy may be that of your daughter, or your son, or yours, or yours, or yours. Although alcohol prohibition required a constitutional amendment, marijuana prohibition was brought about by a single federal law, the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. The driving force behind this law was Harry J. Anslinger, America's first drug czar. Anslinger was the government's expert witness during 1937 congressional hearings on the proposed Marijuana Tax Act. As proof of marijuana's malevolence, Anslinger introduced into evidence the bogus Hearst newspaper headlines that trumpeted the violence, insanity, and death allegedly caused by marijuana. In 1937, when the Marijuana Tax Act uh, was established, there were no data of any sort, much less scientific, about whether this compound was harmful or not. There was just evidence it was being used by people uh, whom we distrusted and feared, and that it was associated with lower class people. You go back and read the record in Congress, it's amazing the lack of information. There were literally questions by members of Congress saying, what is this marijuana? Is it a narcotic or what is it? And there would be a sentence, uh, some, someone would stand up and say, oh, it's the most dangerous new drug coming down the pipe. In terms of what Congress knew in 1937, they didn't know any of that history. The only history that they were given was all these cock and bull stories about how it made people crazy and they went out and killed people under the influence of marijuana. The Tax Act was built on lies and I think it's outrageous that we have legislation that still exists today uh, that, that the, it was based on lies. Despite opposition by the American Medical Association, Congress passed the law unanimously after debating for a grand total of 90 seconds. President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed it into law on August 3, 1937. Theoretically, the new law did not actually prohibit marijuana and hemp. Only a constitutional amendment could do that. But by imposing prohibitive taxes and mountains of red tape, it made cultivation, processing, sales, and any use of the hemp plant whatsoever virtually impossible. Technically, farmers could still legally grow a hemp plant like this one, but only if they could somehow grow it without the leaves and flowers. This law is still in effect today. 
The full reasons behind marijuana prohibition are still being debated. Some experts think racism played a part. So that when poor people, immigrants, take the drugs, we're afraid they're going to rise up, smite, steal, and take the white women. And so we outlaw the drugs because of our fears over that. Others think Harry Anslinger was motivated by ambition and power. A great deal of the reason that marijuana was prohibited was because of self-aggrandizement at the federal level, especially with Harry Anslinger wanting to be the J. Edgar Hoover of his own agency. Jack sees darker motives. His book alleges a high-level conspiracy revolving around Anslinger, Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon, the DuPont Chemical Company, and hemp. Before the Civil War, hemp was the nation's second largest cash crop behind cotton. But while cotton could be processed by machine, slaves were the only cost-effective way to separate the tough hemp fiber from the pulpy core that was used to make paper. When slavery ended after the war, the hemp industry went into decline. The death knell was sounded in the late 1800s when papermakers converted to tree-based pulp. It meant that uh, you could chop down a forest a lot cheaper than you could pay laborers to manufacture hemp fiber for paper. Jack hangs his conspiracy angle on events that happened simultaneously with marijuana prohibition. Coincidence number one. A German immigrant invented a machine called the decorticator. This new mechanical processing device was about to bring hemp into the modern industrial age. Popular Mechanics magazine recognized the potential bonanza for American farmers and entrepreneurs. This article heralded a machine that could process hemp quickly and cheaply for the first time in history. Coincidence number two. The DuPont Company in the 30s came out with both a sulfuric acid method for making paper from trees and a new invention called plastic. Jack's book points out that a hemp resurgence would certainly have been a serious threat to DuPont's petrochemical strategies. And finally, there's millionaire financier Andrew Mellon. Mellon was Anslinger's boss, Harry's wife's uncle, and DuPont's banker. Coincidences number three, four, and five.